And since we know what drives science, money. funding, <laughs> money, money. So one of the other things that happened in the early 2000s is when we noticed wheat prices um, dropping and not coming back up again, was this, um, we began to see a developing of the whole grains mantra. You ask for this, make half your grains whole. Let me tell you a little bit about this. There is powerful political incentive from the grain lobbyists to provide funding for this sort of research. Um, one of my favorite ones is this group called Old Ways. Is anybody familiar with this? Yes. <laughs> Have you dug beneath the surface a little bit of this? This is a processed food trade group that masquerades as a scientifically based nonprofit consumer guide to healthy eating. It says its goal, and I quote, is to combat the rising prevalence of pseudo foods on the market and the threatening tsunami of chronic diseases propelled in part by our poor eating habits. And this, I guess, is, explains why it's funded by Coca-Cola, Domino's Pizza, Dunkin' Donuts, and Kraft. They created, in 2002, that's after the wheat consumption drop, they created a whole grains council. The chairman of the council works for Frito-Lay. And they have scientific conferences, and they invite reporters to their scientific conferences, and they give out advice like this. And this, is, again, is a direct quote off their website. Eating an average of 2.5 servings of whole grain foods each day can lower your risk of cardiovascular disease by one quarter. As compared to what? A dollar? I don't know. One quarter of what? Yeah, that's what you want to ask. Like two dollars and a nickel. I don't know. It doesn't say. It just lowers it by a quarter. I'm assuming that means 25 cents because it doesn't say anything else. But you're not going to define what whole grain is. But, no, there's no. Because you're not, you're supposed to read that and you're supposed to say, Look, I, guess, whole grain. I guess that means I should buy lucky like, right, And I call, we call that surreal food in my family. I ah. that's surreal food. So we need to be able to counterbalance that sort of pseudoscientific nonsense with real nutritional information. Unfortunately, and I, uh, my apologies to Lori here, that we're not just up against money, we're also up against this moral argument about low carb. Despite the fact that there's no reason that human rights and animal rights uh, can't coexist, uh, we get a lot of backlash from the vegetarian community about low carbohydrate diets, even though nutrition and animal rights, you know, they're two very different fields of study. They're two very different concerns. Um, one, at my, I go to UNC Chapel Hill, love my university, go Heels, but one of my public health leaders in my school said last year, um, in response to a, a, a study, the nutrient value of meat is largely irrelevant. Like a jelly donut, a bowl of ice cream, the cheese sauce on the broccoli, or sour cream on a burrito, a piece of red meat isn't good for you. She's a lifetime vegetarian. Do you think this ever came up in her commentary that was printed in our local newspaper? So, so in a move that was especially infuriating to me, right here in New York City, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, can everybody hiss, um, had a campaign last year with a young African-American girl on it, and the message was that kids like her needed access to healthy vegetarian school lunches, not that, and again, I quote, meaty, cheesy, high-calorie fare typically served in school cafeterias. These are the folks who brought us That's meatless right, Mondays. That's right, serving steak at the school cafeteria. Right, exactly. So um, Pam was telling us about that, and she can tell you that most of the calories in the school lunch don't come from fat. <laughs> So this is an issue that's especially um, near and dear to my heart because one, the, my most memorable patient that I ever worked with in the clinic, and the reason why I went back to graduate school was a young African-American woman who burst into tears when I taught her the diet. Um, she sat there and wept, and I thought it was because I was taking her carbs away from her, because some people do have that reaction. Um, and that's what I thought, and I was like, no, no, you know, we can find some sense. She goes, no, you don't understand. I've been hungry for 20 years. I have been eating a low-fat, high-carb diet for 20 years, and I've been miserable. And this was a woman who was in our clinic for weight loss. So clearly her diet hadn't worked, but she thought it was her fault. She thought 
that the reason she couldn't lose weight because she didn't cut out enough calories, that she didn't exercise enough, that after she'd gone out and walked around her mall 15 times because she couldn't resist eating an extra half of a granola bar, that that's why she was overweight. So what I've learned in my studies is that African American population and women are especially poorly suited to this high carb, low fat diet that we've been given. And using a picture of a young African American female to prom promote a vegetarian diet that it is likely to make her very, very ill, it, it offends me highly. And I, so I'm asking you all to, to help give us um, the resources, the, the power to fight that, that kind of message for people like my patient in the clinic. Um, she's what drives my motivation every time I have a biochem exam and think of her. I want the opportunity to make our voice as loud as the voice of PCRM. And if it isn't bad enough that we have these pseudo um, health advocacy groups like PCRM telling us um, ridiculous nutritional advice, we have the American Heart Association, the American Diabetes Association, the American Dietetics Association um, giving us the same sort of advice. Um, I think Pam has listed a litany of their follies there in the, your blue folders. They've actually done a pretty good job. In a recent poll, fully 77% of the American public think that saturated fat is bad for you. And that's what is making our population obese and unhealthy. Even Michael Pollan, who has the right idea, sort of, says, and I quote, two of the, um, bread and pasta are two of the most wholesome and uncontroversial foods known to man. So, has anything really changed since back in 2002 when Dr. Atkins um, had his perhaps overly optimistic view of nutrition? Well, yeah, a few things have trained, changed. We are getting the message, right? Um, low glycemic. Avoid refined carbohydrates, reduce added sugars, eliminate high fructose corn syrup, all of which are recommendations to do what? Lower, Lower carbohydrates, right. But do they ever acknowledge people like Richard, people like Gene Bai, people like Will Yancey, Eric Westman, Steve Finney, Jeff Volick, Dr. Sue, people who have done this work are doing this work. No, they take the message distort it so that the food industry will still fund them, will still fund their research, will still promote these diets that are making us sick. And they do it by sort of co-opting our message. So everybody here today needs to rally together, find the things that we can do. Lori and I are going to go through a list a little later on of all of the things that you can do, and everybody can do something to get our message back and to work towards changing the way that we define healthy food. Somebody said something about what is the definition of healthy food? We. My question was, what's the, what's the definition balanced of a balanced diet? diet? What's the definition there of healthy food? Definition Somebody of was saying diet. that they ask their patients when they say, I, my, my patient says, I eat a healthy diet. What's a healthy, what do you mean by a healthy diet? When Jimmy was saying this, we are going to define what a healthy diet is, and you all are going to help. Thank you.